scripture lesson today is out of 2 Kings 5. We're going to be reading verses 1 to 1 through 14. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aaron. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands from Aaron had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aaron replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending you my servant Naaman, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to see me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots, and he stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent him a messenger to say to him, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry, and he said, I thought he would surely come out to me, and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpa, the rivers of Damascus, better than any of the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned, and he went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and he dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. This is the word of God. Let's pray. Father God, come before you and we're just, we're thankful that you still speak to us through the reading of your word, through the preaching of your word. I just ask that as we look at this section from the Old Testament that it would be more than just a call for, for moralistic living, that we would see your saving power and that we would see the gospel. Just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1618, the Spanish artist Diego Velazquez depicted the Emmaus meal in a painting called The Kitchen Maid at the Supper of Emmaus. Now, Jesus and the disciples, they're in the top left corner, but the painting, it, it, the picture, it draws our attention to the maid. The astonished look on her face suggests that, she just, as she's overhearing this conversation, she just realized that a resurrected Jesus has just eaten a meal in her presence. The kitchen maid in the painting, she appears to be an African slave. The artist lived in a time when, in, uh, in Spain when the, the status of slaves was being debated. But Diego, he's emphasizing her dignity by portraying her as listening intently to Christ's words. She may be unnoticed by the world around her. She may be regarded as inferior. But she dominates the painting therefore our attention. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. The last shall be first. This is God's way. But it's not Naaman's way. To help us understand the story of Naaman, there's, there's three things I want to do. First, we'll, we'll walk through the passage together. Then afterwards, we're, we will interpret the passage. But we'll conclude by, by being able to apply the passage to our lives. The story of Naaman. Well, the first verse presents quite an impressive resume. 
He was a great man in the sight of his master. He was highly regarded. He was victorious for his nation of Aaron. He was a valiant soldier. He was a great man before his king. He was, he was highly renowned because of his success. However, there was one other distinction that undoes his whole resume. One single word at the end of a string of accolades that compromises all the others. In the verse 1, but he had leprosy. This casts an awful shadow over everything else. He was the victim of an incurable disease. There was no doctor he could pay for treatment. He couldn't simply leverage his status and success to heal him. Naaman was helpless. Naaman's servant slave girl tells him of a prophet in her native land of Israel who could heal him. The same Israel Naaman had been conducting these military raids in. Now, Naaman, he believes that anything he needs can get because of his fame and success. So true to form, he wastes no time in using his connection as a royal official to go to the king of Aram. And he has his king write a letter to the Israelite king. Naaman takes money, horses, chariots, and he begins his journey to Israel. But sending Naaman to Israel, to the, to the king, will do him no good. Even the unfaithful king of Israel understands this. Verse 7, he tore his robes and said, And my God, can I kill him back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? Even though this king of Israel is a follower of Baal, he apparently understands that such powers belong to God alone. This story, it just, it mocks the impotence of the kings and the privilege, yet it elevates the meek and humble, like the painting with the African slave, or even like this young servant girl who's instructing him. Now Elisha, he, he, Elisha, he hears of this, and he sends for name in verse 8. Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. Prophet Israel, sorry. Like the servant girl, Elisha, the servant of God, he uses this difficult situation to help Naaman. Elisha views Naaman's presence as an opportunity to show that while his success, it, it can't give him everything. And while a royal monarch cannot heal, God can Naaman arrives with his impressive entourage and, and gifts, yet the prophet Elisha, it, he doesn't even come out to meet him. Instead, he sends a messenger to instruct this prestigious man. Again, a servant instructing a royal official. Verse 10, Naaman was told to wash himself seven times in the Jordan, and his flesh will be restored, and he will be cleansed. Verse 11, but Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. Naaman expected that Elisha, the prophet, would take his money and perform some magic ritual. Or even better, that, that he, would do some, he would require Naaman to do some great thing to, to earn his healing. Naaman, he's a highly privileged commander. And it's an insult to him that he appears before Elisha's house with, with his entourage and his money and his gifts. And Elisha doesn't even have the respect to appear before him. Instead, he's greeted by Elisha's servant. He tells him to wash in the Jordan River. The Jordan waters are they're vastly inferior to those of Naaman's own land. For Naaman to, to dip himself in the measly Jordan that's beneath him. As a great man, he expected some great thing. And this infuriates Naaman. He, he, he gets angry. He leaves. He interprets this as a slight to his own status of a royal official. You see, Naaman expected that Elisha would heal him on the basis of, of his greatness. But this is an opportunity for Naaman to admit he was helpless and weak and to receive his salvation as a, as a free gift, not something he's paid for or he's earned. It wasn't up to Naaman to give a gift, to give him money or horses or chariots. It was up to God's grace. Grace cannot be earned, it cannot be bought. Once again, servants, Naaman's own servants, they approach him as he's leaving in anger, and they reason with him. 
You were willing to do some great thing to earn your healing. Why not listen to this simple request? Naaman follows their advice and is healed, but more than that, Naaman becomes a follower of God. Verse 15, he said, Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. A few things I want to point out regarding Naaman's story. First, leprosy, it, it represents our sin. Naaman was a stranger to God spiritually, but as a leper, he was unclean by the Mosaic law by the Old Testament law. He was unfit for even the presence of God's people. Naaman was helpless and he didn't even realize it. And the Bible declares that by nature all of us are, are spiritual lepers, filthy and unfit for God's presence. As Paul says in Ephesians 4.18, separated from the life of God. We may occupy good positions in this world. We may have obtained praiseworthy achievements. And in the sight of our peers, we can be considered honorable. But how do we appear before the eyes of God? A leper. Those who are, those whom his law pronounces unclean. Those who are utterly unfit for his holy presence. 